can you tell me a little bit about your personal history with video nasties and that era of uh, cultural provocation? Of course. Um, well, so I, I was born in 1982. So my experience growing up, uh, you know, of video nasties was, it was quite different to, to Enid's experience, obviously, because I was a kid. But the, the first time I remember becoming aware of censorship was probably um, more in the, in the early 90s. And we'd been to the video shop and we'd rented a film, me and my mum. And I was always wanting to watch stuff that was beyond my age range. Um, and my mum was like making dinner in the kitchen. I put this film on and this man came up on screen, you know, to introduce the film behind a desk with these kind of this suit and these glasses on. And he said, this film is a 12 or a 13, I can't remember. And uh, it is an offense for anyone under the age of 12 to watch this movie. And I was probably about eight or something. And I completely freaked out thinking that my mum was gonna be arrested for letting <laughs> me watch this film, ran into the kitchen. I was like, mum, I can't watch it. I can't watch it. They're gonna come, you're gonna get into trouble. Um, and she said to me, it was fine, I could watch the movie, I wouldn't get into trouble um, if I wanted to. And I watched the film and the film didn't scare me. Because Do you remember I what the film was? It was The Lady in White. It was spooky. I've seen that, you yeah, know? that is yeah, spooky. It's a spooky film, but I enjoyed the fear because I knew it wasn't real. You know, I was in a safe place to be scared. Whereas this guy at the beginning of the film with his glasses and his suit was very real and that was terrifying. So even as a kid, I understood the difference between fiction and reality. You know, meanwhile, unbeknownst to me, society, you know, in the 80s uh, was mixing these things up. Um, but so I grew up kind of with only access to certain films like The Evil Dead and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Suspiria, the ones that were better known. And then it was more when I moved to London um, and kind of met, you know, people who could give me dodgy copies of, of other films or started going to horror festivals that I was able to see some of the um, lesser known or, you know, less obvious films, basically. Yeah. Um, what do you think kind of evolved or changed or adapted from your short film about this kind of subject matter, uh, Nasty, to this feature film, Censor? Um, so I had the idea for Censor before making Nasty. Um, Nasty was like, almost like an offshoot of Censor in, in that while I was researching Censor, obviously I was reading a lot about the fear around children at this period and how, you know, VHS, the invention of VHS now, meaning that these films could go direct to the home, meant that kids could get their hands on them. And what were these films going to do to the young generation? Were we spawning the next generation psychopath? And I wanted to explore that idea. So I almost thought of Nasty as being like a, a story that could be happening on the other side of town while Enid's having her journey. Um, but through making the short, I I guess I got to explore some of the ideas, both technical and narrative ideas uh, for Censor. So that that kind of fed back into the feature film. Um, so that was kind of, yeah, the order of things. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. <laughs> no, I think you did, definitely. Um, and so for Censor, uh, in, your research, in your research process, which I understand involves speaking to female film censors of that era, what were some of the more surprising or interesting things you learned through that process? I think one of the first, the things that, one of the things that most surprises um, people is, I spoke to one woman called Carol Topolsky and one of the first things I asked her was how she felt about horror. And she said how much she loved horror films and how important they were as a cathartic, experience um, for people and this expression of something darker you know that's that's important to create and watch and and that that I guess isn't what you expect a film censor to say um, and and she's also a psychologist so I think that you know that probably comes into things for her 
as well. But so there was that. But I think one of the things that was really useful talking to, there was another woman I spoke to who really didn't like horror. And um, I, I asked her about the kind of space that they were working in and what that was like. And she said that um, the rooms were really uh, small and there were no windows and it was dark. And so she's indoors all day during daylight watching films. And sometimes she felt like she was watching soft porn, you know, the stuff that was coming through. And she said she'd leave work at night and it'd be dark and she just felt really seedy. And I, I really loved that description and it really influenced the way I wanted, way I approached, I guess, the production design and, you know, the talking to my director of photography about the look of the film and particularly in the census office where, you know, there's no windows, you've got windows in the main office but they're like small windows like they're in underground um i wanted i imagined it being like a rabbit warren where down the kind of uh corridors you can just hear the the screams of people being murdered in other other horror films and this kind of really oppressive place where it's just enid and and the horror that she has to look at every day so there was so much useful stuff, but they were two of the things that stood out from speaking with them. And speaking of the craft of the film, um, so much of the joy of watching it for me came from the way it borrows the language and the grammar of these video nasties, this low budget exploitation era of horror filmmaking. What are some of the kind of stylistic homages you pulled off that you're like the most proud of, like the deepest cut that you're like, I have to put this in? It's funny because you're kind of leaning into these tropes. Um, like one of the things I love about horror is that um, horror fans know horror so well, like horror fans know the language of horror. And so within horror, you can almost create a new language where you're referencing and, and winking and nodding at other things. And, and that was a lot of fun to play with. I guess it's hard to say like, if there was a thing that was the most satisfying or I mean each of the video nasties the films within the film are like a nod to different video nasties so you know I'm referencing um, for example in Asunder which was probably my favorite film within the film to shoot um, I'm like referencing Fulci a lot in that in that one um, but also, I, it always makes me laugh when Tom, the male character in the scene, says, it's Latin, I can work it out. Because there's always a, why in horror films is it that there's always Latin scribe and there's always a character who can speak Latin. It always makes me laugh. So it was fun being able to just um, layer in some of those things that I love about horror and that kind of make me laugh anyway whether they make anyone else laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I spoke to Neve earlier, she mentioned specifically Cannibal Holocaust as being kind of maybe a less fun point of reference for a certain sequence in the film. I was wondering if you could speak to that and unpack how that film and, and some of those sequences helped the two of you create this together. Yeah, um, I think it was important for me to... Um, communicate to the actors um, the gravity of the censor's role. Uh, obviously now we can look back on some of these films and say oh well the effects look dated to us now so obviously it's not real how could they have thought this was you know real or going to do any harm to people. And so when I rehearsed with uh, Neve and Nick Burns, who plays Sanderson, one of the first things I did was uh, made them watch the turtle scene from Cannibal Holocaust, which really, really upsets me. I mean, the, the thing with me is violence towards animals is just, it. yeah, I can't really deal with it. And so I know how much that affects me. So I wanted them to sit and look at this scene and really connect with the idea that these people didn't know what they were about to watch and those films could have anything in them because they needed to um, sit with the serious side of that role as well, you know, um, and kind of connect with that aspect of the job. 
Um, so that's how I was using things like Cannibal Holocaust. That makes sense. Um, and moving away from the kind of the referential meta language we can get as horror filmmakers, especially with a film that's explicitly about horror films, was it ever difficult to kind of write your own filmmaking language on this film to kind of assert your own directorial identity? Or was that something you weren't really concerned with? Um, I think you just have your own directorial identity as a filmmaker. I, I think that's something you develop as a filmmaker through all, all of the work you do and the choices you make. Um, for me, I was nodding towards these films, but ultimately it's Enid's journey and you therefore have a very specific point of view as a filmmaker, which makes it um, your film. Even if you're referencing Fulci or you're nodding towards Argento, um, which makes sense because it's a film about films from that period. Um, ultimately, the choices you're making are about keeping the audience with your character and in their point of view. So, you know, for example, in Asunder, I might have, you know, there could have been a version of that that scene where it was a little bit more hammy and a little bit um, more silly, but that would pull the audience out of Enid's experience watching that film. So you're constantly trying to just see through Enid's eyes. Um, and I think that's where you have your unique point, point of view, you know, as a director. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, it's funny because I get asked about this kind of thing a lot and I, I don't, I didn't really overthink it you know you're creating and you're you're making your own choices as a filmmaker so yeah it's just kind of naturally inherent to your process i would imagine yeah yeah um speaking of enid's journey and seeing it through her eyes you know uh, speaking lightly so as to avoid spoilers the third act really bends what is quote unquote true or real and what is a film and what is psychology and all of this kind of stuff did you and Neve talk about or craft like a roadmap of quote unquote, what is real in this final sequence? Or were you kind of less concerned with what is real? What, what was sort of the compass of that sequence? Um, I think, yeah, you're always with, with Neve. I was always talking about what Enid believes and she has to be playing that and really what any other character believes to, to Neve is not important because she just needs to play Enid's point of view. I think, you know, what's interesting is when you have other characters in scenes who aren't meaning the same truth as what Enid is, is uh, hearing. Um, and that was always like an interesting balance, you know, in both writing and directing the scenes. You know, you're playing, you're asking the actors to play, um, for their own truth, but also then you need it to be played for Enid's truth as well. So you're really playing with that on set um, and then and then building that in the edit, basically, in terms of how you kind of craft the scene. Um, but I think we all invested in Enid's version of this story, like every person making the film became slowly more and more obsessed with Enid <laughs> um, because the whole film is just built around that character and everything is through her eyes. Um, so I don't think we really kind of, yeah, I don't think we went into like too much of what, what's real or what's not real in that sense, because if it's true to Enid, then it's true to the film because you're in her world, you're in her experience. So That makes sense. Um, I think I have time for one more question with you. Um, and I'm curious, given the subject matter of this film, what was the process like for you getting this film rated, either by the MPAA or the BBFC? W w were there any kind of backs and forths? What was it like for you? Well, actually, this, that's something that's handled by the distributor. So as far as I know, it's, um, it's an interesting one because I don't know so much about what's gone on over in the States, but um, the BBFC have been really supportive of the film. Um, <laughs> right from our research. I mean, I was going into the BBFC and, and doing research when we were writing the film. 
Um, but then since then, they invited me on their podcast. So at some point I'm going to go on and have a chat with them. And I'm really excited to, you know, when you're representing somebody's work, even if it's a fictional version of that, it will be very intriguing to hear how they feel. <laughs> um, you know, it represents what they do. And also there's this added like weird meta thing in my head where I'm like, imagine watching the sensors, sensor, sensor. <laughs> um, that would be a really cool kind of behind the scenes video, but I, I don't think they let that kind of thing happen. <laughs> it would be nice if they did on this occasion. We'll get people to uh, start getting, you know, release the Bailey Bond cut of cutting sensor trending. We'll get that. We'll get that yeah. on there. <laughs> cool. That sounds great. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. It was great chatting with you. Yes. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks, Greg.